Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries, Church at the Barn, Saturday Night Life. <laughs> I want to start tonight in Revelation, please, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'll start reading in verse uh, 14, and I'm going to read the New Living Translation. So, write this letter to the angel of the church in uh, Laodicea. This is a message from the one who is the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. I know all things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. But since you're like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. How many of you know hot coffee's good, cold coffee's good, hot tea's good, cold coffee's, cold tea's good? Something in between is the, the word I keep, that keeps coming to me, because I heard somebody say it one time, it's not ever in my vocabulary until I think of this verse, tepid, T-E-P-I-D. Tepid means showing little or no interest or enthusiasm. Lukewarm, half-hearted, neutral. Kind of just along for the ride. So, verse 18, no, verse 17, you, you say I'm rich, I have everything I want, I don't need a thing. Just, you ever heard people pray that way? Just enough for me and my, just, just enough for me and my family. And uh, when I get to heaven, just a little log cabin in glory. <gasps> God's put us in the earth to feed the sick. To spread the gospel around the world, man, that takes some heavy-duty cash. And it takes some effort, it takes some time, it takes some attention. And uh, you can't just goof around with this. And uh, that's, what's, that's what this is about. Quit goofing around. You say, I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So I advise you to buy gold from me because of that. There's a fix. Buy gold from me. Gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will be, not be ashamed of your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you'll be able to see. In other words, God will fix this. Just go to him and uh, repent. Verse 19, correct. I correct everyone and discipline everyone I love. God's correcting and disciplining everybody all the time, if we'll hear him. So be diligent. That means uh, there's some work involved and some steadiness, some uh, over and over and over again to this. Diligent to turn from your indifference. But have you ever said, I don't care? One of my favorite phrases. God pointed that out to me today. Sometimes when you don't care, it's, it's easy to get an agreement because you really don't care. Other times you're just saying, I don't care when you really do care and you're just lying. You know. That's what he pointed out. <laughs> so what did I do about that? Well, you just repent, see? So you Get some gold from God. Get rid of that. Turn around and go the other direction. Plead the blood over it. Verse 20, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open a door, I will come in. And we'll share a meal together. We will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious who sit with me will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone who has ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Anyone with ears to hear, would that be everyone, must listen to the Spirit. So I'm talking about ears on the side of your head. So people wonder, well, what about deaf people? 
It's talking about spiritual ears, your spiritual senses. He who has ears to hear in your heart, where, where you know the difference between a green light and a red light, right and wrong. Amen. Then pay attention to it, is what he's saying. Anyone that has ears in there to hear, listen to the Spirit. Understand what he's saying to the church. It's, it's time. Now let's read uh, um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in the same version. New Living Bible. You know this. You should know this. This, he's writing this to uh, uh, minister the gospel. And anyone who is, is uh, born again, filled with the Spirit of God, has been called into the ministry of reconciliation. So this is written to, to every Christian. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. How many of you have ever noticed anything difficult about what's going on around the world? Very difficult time. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unforgiving. No, excuse me. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They'll have something to do that's more fun than what God wants them to be doing. It's a little bit plainer in the Wyoming translation. There are things that God's asked his people to do that aren't that much fun. You've got to be diligent to do it, but that's where the power of God's at, and that's where God changes people from what they've picked up in the world to what he wants them to have out of his kingdom. He wants you clean of the barnacles and the junk that the world's trying to get on the body of Christ. And he wants that all cleaned off of there. And he wants you to shine like a light in this world. And uh, if you're not paying any attention to him, except when you don't have any other choice, which is nobody in this room on a Saturday night, but there's, this is getting out to places where God wants, if, they have, if you haven't turned this off right now, repent. Before you hit the off button, Get on your knees and say, thank you, Jesus, for the blood, and be free. Be free of this. Because, uh, look at the uh, verse 5, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. This message tonight is about that power and the way to get into that power is to get rid of the tepid. Turn on the stove. Turn up the stove. Turn up the heat. The fire of the Holy Ghost. Turn it up. There are, there are uh, three major points to this message tonight that I want to be sure and make plain. Uh, but first, I think, I want to talk about a few things that God showed me since. When were we here? Thursday night? That was the, since Thursday night. Um, I have been believing God because I've read... I, read a lot of Smith Wigglesworth stuff. And when I first got interested in the Word of God in 1978, um, between 1978 and 1981, 82, I read, a, I read only, certain, um, only certain authors, and I listened to only certain tapes, because I had been raised in this religion that I read about um, that you read about in Timothy, if you read all of Timothy. 
And he, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And because they were denying the power thereof, and I was a teenager, uh, I was just bored. I, church was boring where I went to church. And uh, I, now I'm, I'm not saying that, that um, there aren't things about church that require discipline. And if there aren't things that are more fun, if all you're out to do to have fun, there are things that are more fun someplace else. But if you get in the right church, you should, you, if you go there regularly for any amount of time, you should miss it the first time you miss. Amen. But here's what happens. The second time you miss in a row, you don't miss it as bad. And the third or fourth time, the world, if you're not soaking up the light, you're soaking up the dark because you're living in the dark and it's everywhere. And you're hearing things and you're seeing things and you're doing things and it fills you up. And, and, and we being born in sin are very used to how that works. And we fall over there into that downhill slide really easy and really fast. The good news is God's more powerful. The light's brighter than darkness. The light puts out darkness. Darkness can't put out the light. But if you're not being filled with the light and you're being uh, exposed to darkness all the time, you get in a bad position. It, it's a... Um, so, in, so back to Wigglesworth for a minute. Um, in 19... 36. Smith Wigglesworth uh, was 70 years old, and he was in South Africa, or he might not have been, he was, he was going in to talk to David Duplessis, and uh, he was a South African preacher, 31 years old, just a young man with the head of a whole, head of the ministry that Wigglesworth was watching in South Africa, pretty big job. And Wigglesworth come in the room and just uh, pushed him right up against the wall and started prophesying to him. And Wigglesworth was a brusque, um, boisterous, big, strong, loud man. And when he spoke, people listened. <laughs> and he just got right in this guy's face and delivered a message. It's a message I've been looking for because I knew I'd read it years ago and I had a hard time finding it. But the gist of the message is that there's com coming a day that Wigglesworth wouldn't see, but, in, but Duplessis would see the, at least the initial phase, uh, the, the beginning of it. And uh, here's what Wigglesworth said um, in a nutshell, that the power of God is going to hit this world, and he, he was looking at it from the English perspective. He's going to come out of England through Europe and, uh, and, and into South Africa and spread throughout the world. Now, from our perspective and, and being farther in time than 1936, we can see that God's actually sent the light out from a lot of places. But it is reaching around the world right now, and we're seeing what he's prophesying here. He told Duplessis, though, this is the part you want to get, that it was going to hit the liturgical churches. It was going to hit denominations that look like they're so far over into this tippidness that there's no hope. But God's going to go in there and boil their water. And when he does, the people are either going to come in or they're going to run. But the Dupless, Duplessis had a problem with that because he had been teaching everybody the same thing that I think all Pentecostal people have been teaching everybody ever since. And that's to come out from among these tippid and come into a fellowship that's uh, walking in the full gospel. 
The problem with that is, what about the people that are in there that they're, that they're leaving behind that haven't got a hold of it yet? Wouldn't it be faster if they were able to get filled, maybe fellowship? We should be fellowshipping with spirit-filled believers um, in, in, any, in any city in America. There should be a time when you get around other people. If they believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you should be in on it with them. Really, that's not a bad thing to, to be around Christians no matter what they believe, as long as you're not antagonizing them and making them mad. And uh, you can agree to agree to what you agree to and get in some kind of unity. Because unity is coming, hallelujah, to the body of Christ. So Wigglesworth prophesied that. Duplessis said, I'm having trouble with that because... It looks to me like they're going to have to come out from that unbelief to be protected from it. And Wigglesworth's telling him, no. God's going to light them up from the inside out. Right in the middle of that unbelief, he's going to light some of them up. And when people see the real thing, my new favorite song, I think we'll sing it next week, the real thing. The real thing isn't religion. The real thing is a relationship with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. It's a balance. It's not lopsided all Holy Spirit and it's not lopsided all Word. It's a balance. It's like the, it's like the Holy Spirit's one wing and the, and the Word of God, Jesus, is the other wing. And, and the body of Christ needs to do both now. For 2,000 years, God's been getting revelation after revelation after revelation into the body of Christ. And the body of Christ has got a revelation, started a domination through the rest of them away. And he gave a revelation to these guys, they got a revelation of it, and they threw the rest of them away. And then he gave a revelation to this bunch, and they put a name on their denomination and threw the rest of it away. So you have viscerans and viscerics, and these isms, <laughs> ists, and so on, and they're all stuck on their little piece of the pie. It takes all the pieces. We need the whole pie. Amen. We've needed it for quite some time, but I don't know why we haven't been preaching this other than we're running out of time, and it's got to get out there. We've got to get over our I'm right and you're wrong. We've got to get over our hurt from our past. And what that denomination did to me, I'm so tired of hearing. You know, when somebody's just born again and they're like three weeks old and they're, they're still crying about how they got duped by religion, that's understandable. They need their, di they need their diapers changed. And they need fed the milk of the Word of God. But babies are not supposed to stay babies. You're supposed to grow up. You grow, you grow up and keep growing until you can pack armor. And you put the armor on and you get in the fight. And when you get in the fight, there's no bawling, squalling, and sucking your thumb anymore. And there's no looking down your nose at somebody else's denomination because they don't have the revelation that you have. Do you know what? We, don't, we all don't have it all yet. Everybody, word of faith people, are making mistakes. They just don't know what they are. I truly think if they knew what they were, they'd quit making them. I know I would, but I don't know what they are. I can see mistakes other people are making that I made that God showed me was wrong. And when I changed, I know I'm right because the power of God hit and the miracle flowed and the miracles testified and that message worked, didn't it? Especially if you see it work over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. That's not some intercessory prayer bringing that in in spite of what you believe. That's, that's something that you've got a hold of from God that works. Hallelujah. So, Wigglesworth, this was 1936. I spent some time today looking up what has happened 
since 1936 in the way of revivals. I don't have near the time tonight to get into this, but it is impressive what God has done in the way of absolute, full-blown, couldn't be anything but God miracles after miracle after miracle. It usually started a revival of some kind or another in the... Uh, uh, well, anything that's in the book of Acts has been happening regularly since 1936, and they're picking up steam. It's just picking, it is, it's growing. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So last month, October, I, I, I left my notes, so I'm not going to get into this very deep, but last month, October, 20, huh? Night, months before that, October, 20, just a little over a month ago, there was a uh, uh, traveling priest came to the Catholic Church in Gillette, Wyoming, and uh, put on a three night, uh, three nights of meetings. And one of the th things he taught was the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Three nights, the altars were full, and people were receiving, uh, th the gifts of the Spirit were moving. I'm, without my notes, I'm not going to get in very much detail, but Thursday night I listened to a woman that was there. Um, and she didn't have very much time to tell the story, but the Holy Spirit was filling in a few blanks for me while she was talking, and then I spent a bunch of time since then looking at things that have been happening around the United States and the world where the Catholic Church is concerned. And the reason I'm doing that is I, this, this is important because the Catholic Church is over 50% of the Christians on the earth. And I don't care what people say about it. If they believe in Jesus, they're born again. And that other nonsense has got to stop. Are they doing some things that the rest of us don't agree with? Yeah, but God's not interested in what, they've, what they add to and subtract from. He can fix that. He can fix that. I said, he, he not only can fix that, he's fixing that. <laughs> and what he's interested in is, do they believe Jesus is Lord? If they do, they're, they're Christians. They're full of the Spirit of God. There's been a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, they don't say it that way. That's why we need to watch out our little Pentecostal talk or charismatic talk or Baptist talk or Catholic talk or Lutheran talk or Methodist talk or so on and so on. I'd have to stay here and say 860 some names to hit them all. And it's, it's not necessary because there's one church. The Bible's very plain on there's one church. Yeah, and it's the, no, 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 no. It's all of these put together. If they believe Jesus is Lord, that's the church. And it's time for unity in the church. And the way that's going to happen is for tipid, lukewarm Christians to boil or get out of the way because this church is moving. This church is moving. Now, I can show you scripture in script, several scriptures in the Bible that there's a, a, there is a rapture coming and God is going to take the believers out of here. Depending on what denomination you're in, depends on how they teach who's, what believers are going or what aren't or what a believer amounts to when it says that and so on, so on, so on. I'm telling you this, what I found in the Bible for sure, if you're looking for him, you're going. So I, I just look for him every day. I'm looking for him all the time because I'm going. 
and that's enough. I found that in more than two places. So that's a spiritual truth that works. I'm hanging on to that. And uh, now this, okay. So Wigglesworth come in later. He went out 10 minutes. 10 minutes later, he come back in. Duplessis is there thinking, oh my God, here he comes again. Because he had him slammed up against the wall, just hollering this prophecy at him. And it went on a while. I haven't told you near all everything he said. But he come in and he said, hello, how are you? I'm, and introduced himself. And, and uh, Duplessis is thinking, was he nuts? <laughs> and uh, well, he, he nailed him down on why that happened. And Wigglesworth said, when I came in here, I wasn't coming in here to see you. I was coming in here to deliver a message from God. He said, now I'm here and we can talk about it if you'd like to. And then he began to talk to him about, you're going to have to get rid of your idea that these people have to come out of these churches. And you're going to have to embrace what God's doing in them. And this is the part I was looking for that I'd seen years ago and I'd finally got back to when that end time revival hits, Pentecostals want in on that outpouring, they're going to have to go to a liturgical church to get it. Won't that blow their dress up? <laughs> I, I, I said that. Wigglesworth didn't say that. <laughs> well, it would. The Holy Ghost, fire. The infilling of the Holy Ghost, like, like fire in that upper room, come down on 120 people and then went down inside of them, and God hasn't forgot how to do that. Don't let anybody tell you that went away. That's absolute nonsense. There isn't anything God gave the church goes away until the church isn't here anymore. Amen. And we haven't got there yet. You haven't missed a rapture. It hasn't happened yet. But it's going to happen, and we're going to leave. We're going to be with him in the air. He's going to appear in the eastern sky. The dead in Christ will rise first. That means bodies are coming up. Bodies that have been burnt and scattered or blew to bits or whatever happened to them, there's going to be a trumpet sound, and then the, the voice of God, Jesus is going to say, come up here. Revelation chapter 4, if we kept reading. Come up here. And all them parts are going to find themselves. Those bodies are going to form. And when and Jesus appears, the, the people in heaven, the saints in heaven, will appear with him. And those bodies will find those saints. And they'll fill up those bodies and they'll become immortal, just like the one Jesus had when he was come up out of the grave. And while that's happening, those of us who are alive will be caught up together with them to meet him in the air, and we're all going to get those bodies all at the same time, and we're out of here, and the rules change. And anybody left is going to have an experience that if they could trade for the one we had, they'd trade, but they can't. They're too late. Now, they can still make it to heaven, but it's not going to be funny, and it's not going to be fun, and they're not going to have these promises. They won't be able to get, they won't be able to believe God for anything because it's not the church age anymore, and everything went over into judgment, and it's going to be uh, a wreck. And according to the Bible, it will get worse every day. Seven years. 356, how many days in a year? 356. 355 and an extra one once in a while. Anyway, <laughs> there'll be seven times so they'll go through that cycle. And, and you know the day that the end of the world is. If anybody's still here and you're seeing this, just count off seven years from the day the church disappeared, and that's the day Jesus is coming back. 
2,555 days. See how I did that in my head? Nope. <laughs> I can't believe I can read Mary Lou's phone from that far away. That's really good. 2,555 days of judgment being poured out in the earth. It starts out not, not much different than when the church leaves, except there's nobody here praying, so it starts deteriorating really fast, and the Antichrist is revealed at moment. He comes on the scene to explain where the church went. He'll tell a great big whopper that everybody left wants to believe, and um, they'll get, that'll start the ball rolling downhill, the snowball going downhill. Okay, so uh, here's, the, here's what I want to get to tonight. There is only one baptism of the Holy Spirit. I, I'm quoting Rick Renner right now. I should have said this. is a Rick Renner quote, quote that I heard the other day. There is only one baptism of the Holy Spirit, but many infillings. And Rick said, I ask for one every day. From what I understand, this Catholic service, one of the, one of the messages was on the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So I started to say that before. They say they have a different terminology than Pentecostals do and a different terminology. We have a different terminology from the Baptists. You know, everybody's got their little churchy ways of saying things. And when somebody says the same thing, their mind goes to what they know about that. While the other part person's mind goes to what they know about that. It isn't about what we think we know when somebody says something. It's about what God meant when he said it. And it's about understanding each other. So, I know a lot of people, because I've, I've, I've ministered a long time, and I've, I've known the answer. God told me the answer. This is the answer to this person's problem. You're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and you're not praying in tongues. Get with it. That was a God counsel from the Holy Ghost to that person. Now, if they won't do that, um, kind of like Wigglesworth, that's what God said, do with it what you want. But if, you're, if you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, read about it, learn about it, and quit trying to throw things away because it's not comfortable, and, and figure out what the Bible said, not what other people say. Find out what the Bible says. It's real simple. In Luke uh, 11, I think, or 13, in there somewhere, <laughs> Jesus uh, uh, said, would, uh, would God, would, if you asked for a scorpion, would your father, or no, if you asked for a fish, would your father give you a scorpion? You remember that? If you asked for something good, would he give you something bad? And he said, so why, when you ask for the Holy Spirit, will he give you something evil or wrong or bad? No, and will he not give it to you? No, he'll give it to you. And that's not, that's not giving you the Holy Spirit at the new birth. When you say, Jesus is Lord of my life, you've got all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get. What the baptism, we call a baptism of the Holy Ghost, or you call it the infilling, whatever you want to call it, is when the Spirit of God comes upon you like he did those believers in the upper room in the book of Acts. Now here's... This is Mike, okay? It doesn't say this in the Bible. They didn't know very much about any of this. It just happened. I believe in the upper room, they began praying in other tongues. And I believe they had a good get-down, good-time party praying in other tongues, all of them at once. No order whatsoever. Just having a blast in the Holy Spirit, 120 people at the same time. When they came outside doing that, God, give, God changed that from the praying in tongues this way to the Father. He changed it to the gift of tongues, and he got started giving them a language that people there did understand, and then, then you read about it. That melting pot of Jerusalem from people coming from all the surrounding countries speaking all kind of different languages. Everybody heard the gospel preached in their own tongue, and they could understand every word they said. And then people were saying, 
That Jew doesn't know my language. How's he doing that? What's it, what is it? It's a, it's a demonstration to unbelievers that there's something going on here that can't be anything but Almighty God. Can't be duplicated by anybody else. God hasn't quit doing this. People have quit believing this, and God wants to do it again. That's time. So there's what you can do is, what you can do with that is pick it up and ask God help. That's a really good prayer. It, it really is. He knows what you need. And when you say help, he knows exactly how to get what you need to you. Ask it in faith. God said he'd help you. Help in the name of Jesus. Help me come, from, help me come up a level. Light, light the fire and bring me to a boil in the name of Jesus. I'm tired of tepid and I want the real thing. In Jesus' name. That's what that song's about, by the way the real thing. It's time. It's time for the kingdom to come. So the three points here, number one, faith doesn't come by praying. You can ask God for more faith and ask God for more faith and ask God for more faith and you're not going to get anything but laryngitis if you do it long enough. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God preached. You've got to get in the Word, and you've got to stay in the Word, and you've got to do it every day, and you've got to do it whether you feel like it or not. Number two, miracles don't come by studying the Bible. The faith comes to believe what God said. You find out what God said, and the faith comes to believe it with, but you get the miracles by believing God, doing what God said, and the Spirit of God on the inside of you is going to do the miracle just like he did for Jesus. Jesus said, it's not me, it's the Spirit in me doing this, and that's where we need to get to. And we need to get there um, on purpose whenever we need to. Well, the Bible said that the Spirit uh, comes as He wills, and it does. And that's, tar that's 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and that's the gifts of the Spirit that come from the Holy Spirit to people. Uh, there's nine of them in the King James Bible, uh, the way the King James states it. There's nine groups of gifts. No, there's nine types of gifts and three groups. Power gifts, revelation gifts, and uh, edifying gifts. And uh, all nine of them came on the body of Christ in the book of Acts. You can, you can pick them out of the book of Acts all over the place. And all nine of them are still here. Two of the nine are tongues and interpretation of tongues. That's not talking about your prayer language to God this way. It's, that's talking about the gift that comes as the Holy Spirit wills on somebody to people, from God this way to people. It could be to one person or it could be to a group of people. And when that gift is in operation, the other one is there too, which is the interpretation of tongues. And somebody needs to say in the known language what's being said in a language that hardly anybody understands, especially the speaker, if anybody understands it at all. This isn't taught clearly ever because many, 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 many people who have been baptized in the Holy Ghost and prayed in tongues for years, haven't ever asked God about this, and they don't have a revelation of it. But it is a fact. These are two different, these are two different uh, things talked about at the same time in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Praying in, praying in the Holy Ghost 
And it doesn't always say praying. You can't get it out of the English Bible that way. But if it's talking about the Spirit of God giving you something to say to God, that's praying in the Spirit. If it's God giving you something to say to people or into the earth, that's um, the gift of tongues. That's what I'm calling the gift of tongues. You see the two directions. It's two different things. Same Holy Spirit, but you can't do this one just because you feel like it. Yea, yea, thus saith the Lord. Well, don't say that unless he did give you something to say, because what you're doing is saying to the people, this is what God said. So, to, so many times people are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and they start praying in tongues trying to give a message this way, and that's not what the Bible said. It said that comes as he wills. You can do this any time you want to, as long as you want to. You can stop right in the middle. You can, you can, you can, <laughs> it's for your edification. A man of praise in an unknown tongue edifies, he said, well, I don't know. You're just edifying yourself. That's better than being worn out, burn out, run over, sucking your thumb, crying like a baby, wondering why God did this. <laughs> You need we need edified. We need edified constantly, particularly people in the ministry. I, I, I've, I've given this example before, but it's, it's bad enough. It needs, I need to say it again. I was in a minister's conference with the, with the, um, the seats full. It wasn't a big place. What do you think was there that day, Sherry? 150? Three, was 300 people, 300, 300 pastors. And uh, the, at the end of the message, this, this uh, speaker said, if you if you're, uh, feel defeated and uh, um, tired and worn out, that's it, tired, worn out, um, um, Hurting, yeah, hurting was one of the words, and he went on for a while. Then I want you to come to the altar. Man, I mean, that place emptied, and all these preachers are up here at the altar, and there were four or five of us left sitting in the chairs. I'm thinking, learn how to pray in the Holy Ghost and edify yourself. What is the matter? What are all these supposed pa uh, leaders of the church doing down here worn out when God told them how to stay edified? Moses saw a bush that burnt and never burnt up. And the reason it didn't, it was the fire of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't fire, it wasn't burning the bush, it was the fire of the Holy Ghost on the bush. We're supposed to burn, church. We're supposed to be a light on a hill. We should be on fire and never burn out. But if you're doing it in the natural, woo. It's a hard road to hoe. If you do it in the supernatural, it's almost all God. It's your mouth. It's your faith. It's your believing the word and saying it with your mouth and expecting it to come to pass in your life. That's all you have to do. God's got the rest of the heavy lifting. But if you don't do, that's the point tonight, if you don't do that part, it's not going to, it, just because it's available doesn't mean it's happening. And I know that some people say, well, I saw this happen and I saw this happen and that wasn't done. You don't know who was praying. You don't know who's praying for you right now. And people praying in the Spirit usually don't know who they're praying for when they're praying. Sometimes you're just praising God in a, in a, in a, well, just praising God. Sometimes you're getting to praise God and getting to do it right. Because your head's not in the way. A man that prays in an unknown tongue, his mind's unfruitful. You can't, you can't understand a word you're saying. Unless God gives you an interpretation. You switch over into English and you, and you say some things you didn't really know you knew. It happens. But, What's happening when, while you're doing that, it's all good.
No bad thing can happen when you're that when you're trusting God that far. That's another thing Wigglesworth said. They asked him how he did these miracles, raising people from the dead, stuff like that. He said, "Well, I do. I do it like this. I just, I just get out there on a limb of a branch, and and I just saw that branch off with my faith. I use every bit of faith I have." And when I run out of faith, then God's going to have to pick up the slack and fill me with a gift of faith. And uh, he does. Why did God do that for him? Because he believed he would. Because he said he would, and Willsworth believed he would. Why? Well, isn't that a remarkable, isn't that remarkable that God did that for that guy? He'll do that for anybody that'll do what Smith Wigglesworth did. He's no respecter of persons. The Bible says that all over the place. God is no respecter of persons. He is a respecter of faith. He's a respecter of people that believe him. Third point. First one was faith doesn't come by praying. Third, second one, miracles don't come by the word alone. Just word study won't get them. You get full of the word and you get fat and uncomfortable if you're not doing something with it. So the third point, time and attention need to be balanced in both. You need to do both. You need to study daily. And you need to pray and, and uh, walk with the Holy Spirit daily. The Word, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the, and the gifts of the Spirit every day. Not just Saturday night or Sunday morning or Tuesday night or um, some special occasion, but every single day. Did we decide there were 365 and once in a while a goofy one. So... 365 days of normal year. Walk every, time with God every day. The best thing might be just what uh, Renner said, just get up first thing in the morning. Benny Hinn wrote a book, Good Morning Holy Spirit. That's what he did, whatever time his eyes come open and he's conscious, come out of sub into awareness. Good morning, Holy Spirit. Just start a conversation with God and keep it going all day until you fall asleep. He said if you walk with God all day, he'll walk with you all night while you're sleeping. So if you're having trouble with insomnia, you're having trouble with bad dreams, you're having trouble with uh, things that aren't going right while you're sleeping, um, might pick up the pace there before you go to bed. Might fall asleep praising God. Well, let's, uh, let's call it a night. Let's stand. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. I thank you that, that uh, you're no respecter of persons. I thank you that this revival that's coming right now is going to hit every denomination in every city, in every county, every state of the United States. It's also going to hit every country of the world. It's going to hit every island. It's going to hit places where any, if there's a human there, this goth, this power is going to be there. It's here, the Great Awakening, the end time revival. It's exploding around the world. And it's ours. We get to be in on it. And we thank you for it. Thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.